Hey, what's going on, everybody? And happy Labor Day weekend. All that good stuff. September uh, 5th, I believe it is. Sunday, September 5th, 2021. Wow, September. Got not that much time left in 2021. Uh, either way, thank you for joining me either live or recording or on uh, the Humanity Matters podcast for the Humanity Matters show. I'm your host, Philip Fletcher, where we discuss faith and philosophy, nonprofit leadership, and social issues. We want to engage with ideas on what it means to be a human being and what it means to flourish as a free human being uh, in this world that we are in. So I am thankful for you joining me on uh, today, just as the customary things. Be patient. Uh, if you have not connected with me on any of my social media outlets, I would. Uh, appreciate a connect with you, whether that's on Twitter, over on Facebook at Dr. Philip Fletcher. Also, you can find me on YouTube where this show is broadcasting live as well. Uh, please subscribe. I'm trying to hit that 200. Okay. So if you have not subscribed to YouTube, please do me a quick favor. Jump over to youtube.com. Look up Dr. Philip Fletcher. You'll find my handsome face and subscribe. I would greatly appreciate it. Something that simple. You'll get notifications when I post uh, content and the shows as well. You can visit me on my website at philipfletcher.org at philipfletcher.org. Patreon. Hey, there are some things that I like to talk about either in a podcast, uh, audio format or written format or uh, video format. So over on Patreon, uh, this is a way that you can get some very uh, exclusive content that I don't put out on YouTube uh, or on my website or on my podcast over on anchor.fm. So if you would like to be a sponsor, be a Patreon, I would greatly appreciate it. Just go over to Patreon, look up my name or hit me up. I'll send you the link and $5, $15, $25, You'll get access to exclusive content and also uh, some cool merch and thank yous and all that kind of good stuff. And again, it's stuff that I'm just choosing for a variety of reasons not to put out on Facebook or on Twitter because, you know, it's got some stuff on there that just being even a lot more honest than um, and have less of a filter on particular things that are going on uh, in our society, including faith and leadership, so on and so forth. So I would greatly uh, appreciate your support. Got some great uh, supporters already um, able to continue to do this work. So if you want to connect with me over on Patreon, I would greatly appreciate it. So we're going to talk about a couple of different things. Uh, on today. Hey, if you want to connect with me, uh, always comment. This is on Facebook as well as on uh, YouTube. Give me a, con uh, a comment and I would love to just <laughs> respond. And if you want, I may even bring you on. So uh, if you're comfortable with that, obviously, if not, that's cool. Uh, but always you can send me a email. And that email is over at Humanity Matters Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, Humanity Matters Podcast at gmail.com. And I will uh, gladly respond to your email, gladly respond uh, to whatever comment that you may have, because um, I love positive and negative critique. I do. I really do. Uh, I think that's one of the best things that can happen because it has me, once again, go back and look at the things that I've learned and test those things. Uh, gives me the opportunity also to learn about some new things, right, that I had not considered. Or maybe you have a book that you need me to read that offers a different perspective. Uh, there's a video you want me to see, so on and so forth. And I love all those things. Um I think it's very important to engage with a variety of ideas. And for me, there is no controversial idea. There's just not. Um, I greatly 
I appreciate the opportunity to learn from people. And there's going to be things I don't agree with, but I still want to learn. I want to be able to uh, accurately represent somebody's position, even a position I don't agree with. I want to be able to understand where it is a person is coming from and why they hold that uh, idea and that particular belief and obviously um, how they're seeking to carry out. So I think that's very important uh, in the society in which we live. So it's better that way instead of being like a douchebag to one another. And if we're not willing to listen and learn uh, from ideas that challenge us, then, uh, you know, that's a lot of pride. And I think we should be able to be humble enough and recognize that all of us are fallible. Uh, none of us have complete knowledge. Uh, none of us have all the answers, but we can all learn from uh, one another. So that's that. So first uh, off the block, we're going to be talking about discrimination. We're going to be talking about self-care. And then we're going to talk about the abortion law that passed in Texas. A lot of people have been talking about abortion once again. You know, we've been talking about COVID. Excuse me. We've moved from race. We moved to COVID. We moved back to the global war on terrorism with what happened in Afghanistan. Now we're back to abortion. All the while, we got mandates happening, discussion of mandates, pa vaccine passports, trying to figure out what those individuals are doing in Washington and what bills they're seeking to sign. It may be a whole lot of money. All right. But nonetheless, uh, today we're going to talk about discrimination. We're going to talk about self care, talk about the abortion law. All of this as a segue right, really has to do with how do we view one another? Do we consider each other as human beings? And if we consider one another as human beings, what is it that is um, afforded to the human being? That by virtue of me being a human being and existing and walking and breathing on this earth, what is do me, right? Essentially, I'm talking about justice, but as a human being, what is it that is due to me simply because I am a human being? And then secondly, uh, what is due to me, not only as a human being, but then also what is due to me as an American citizen, right? Um, I can't, you know, communicate, I could in general, understand what is due to me as a human being in another country, say Mexico or France or South Korea or any other country, right? And then that's when we get into discussion of the individual's relationship to the state and the individual's relationship to other individuals, his or her citizens. But what I'm talking about and what I can speak about is and, and reflect on uh is what is it that is due to me as a human being? And then secondly, what is it that is due to me as a human being who lives in America so that I can flourish as I want to flourish, right? If you follow me, I talk about how we should have purpose um, and that purpose should lead us to discover meaning in our lives. Right. And that and that meaning and that, that purpose and that meaning is going to look different from e for each one of us. But nonetheless, as a human being, what is due to me? Like what is due to me? So huh, getting started talking about discrimination. So uh, the Washington Post. Right. Has an opinion piece and it was published on September 3rd, 2021. And this opinion piece was by Ruth Marcus. And uh, the headline is, doctors should be allowed to give priority to vaccinated patients when resources are scarce. Now, that's the headline. Again, doctors should be allowed to give priority to vaccinated patients when resources are scarce. I said, okay, Ruth. All right, you published this. Um, I talk about this actually some more over on my Patreon. Uh, there was an Atlantic article that didn't address healthcare, but it 
made the argument in terms of flights, air, airline travel, that uh, those who are unvaccinated should uh, not be allowed to fly. That since they are making what was called the irresponsible choice or not the, the right choice to be vaccinated, that those individuals should be put on a no-fly list. Now, if you are not familiar with the term no-fly list, no-fly list was heavily used after 9-11, that the government, um, working with their different agencies, created these no-fly lists really to combat terrorism, all right? Uh, and so now, in that Atlantic article, that term was floated again in regards to individuals who have chosen not to take the one of the vaccines, whether that's Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson and Johnson. Um, there's one other one that skips my mind right now. But nonetheless, so there's been writers, intellectuals, if you will, who are making an argument that there should be a distinction in regards to individuals, American citizens who have chosen to take one of the particular vaccines and those who have not chosen to take one of the vaccines, okay? So this distinction is being made and this distinction would be played out in terms of access to particular services. So first we've seen like in uh, New York City, uh, San Francisco, uh, New Orleans, um, that steps have been taken in regards to showing proof of uh, vaccination in order to access particular services like restaurants, gyms, music venues, movie theaters, so on and so forth. Now, what that is seeking to do is create a pressure on those individuals that uh, it's a looking at a trade-off, correct? Looking at a trade-off and saying that I want to participate in these services versus do taking this vaccine. And so that individual would have to be like, well, I want to take these services, so I'll just go ahead and take the vaccine. Okay. So the Atlantic was making that argument in regards to airline travel. Now, uh, September 3rd, uh, the Washington Post again produced an opinion piece by Ruth Marcus, all right? And uh, she writes this, and I'm quoting here. I'm going to come right out and say it. In situations where hospitals are overwhelmed and resources such as intensive care beds or ventilators are scarce, vaccinated patients should be given priority over those who have refused vaccination without legitimate medical or religious reason, close quote. So she, I appreciate Miss Marcus by offering a clear glass of water, right? And making the argument that priority should be given to those who have been vaccinated. And those who have refused vaccination should be put at a lower list. Now, again, I'm making our, I am presenting just the information We've moved from the arguments from for airline restriction now to something very significant in regards to a person's health considerations. All right. Now, she does admit that, and I'm quoting, this conflicts radically with acceptable medical ethics. I recognize continuing on and under ordinary circumstances, I agree with those rules. The lung cancer, cancer patient who's been smoking two packs a day for decades is entitled to the same treatment as the one who never took a puff. Now that's under normal circumstances. She's making an argument continuing on the drunk driver who kills a family gets a team doing its utmost to save him. Although not perhaps a liver transplant. If he needs one, doctors are healers, not judges close quote. Then she goes on to say, but the coronavirus pandemic. So she is setting up an argument that is saying if a cancer patient, comes in and he or she is unvaccinated, that individual is 
who is unvaccinated, that cancer patient is of a lesser priority than a person who has been vaccinated. And if I follow her reasoning, someone who has no cancer. All right. So she goes on to say, this describes those individuals who are choosing not to take a vaccine. She describes them this way. Now, remember, let's look at the context. And I'm just simply setting up the context. We've had, if you're unvaccinated, your access to restaurants, theaters, gyms, we're going to be restricted. Then another Atlantic piece, an Atlantic piece comes out kind of doubling down saying, hey, let's restrict airline travel. Now we've got somebody else writing about, hey, let's move those who are unvaccinated lower down the list in terms of priority when they come to the hospital seeking particular care. So she describes vaccine resistors this way. And I quote, vaccine resistors are different. Their refusal to take the shot doesn't just affect their own health. It poses a known risk to the health of others, especially now with the spread of the Delta variant. To decline to be vaccinated is to fail to live up to your duty, to your community, and it should mean that you forfeit, if necessary, your claim to equal medical treatment. Now, we for years have made this argument that as Americans, that we should receive equal treatment, equal treatment under the law, specifically, most importantly, equal treatment in regards to going to health centers, uh, medical facilities. There's always There's been this consistent argument of equality and equity. Now, an argument is being made because of this particular situation with this pandemic. Let's set that all aside. We shouldn't treat people equal in return in regards to serving their health needs. All right. She goes on to describe that it's a duty. Okay. Interesting uh, language. All right. Interesting uh, language. Now, the question is this. The question is this, because somewhere in here, she uh, makes a particular claim that I want to get to. All right. Now, because of a utility reason, right? I, I, I hear her making a utilitarian argument. All right. So because hospitals have limited resources, and I'm wondering what's happened with all that CARES Act money that was issued out to medical facilities over the last two years. What are they doing with that money? Right. Because they're severely strained. All right. If there were not areas where vaccination rates are dangerously low, and I'm quoting, and the Delta variant is spreading fast, there would be no problem. The vaccine refuser, although morally blameworthy, so now she's not only making an argument from duty, right, but it's also, this is a, a, the individual is acting immorally because they have not done their duty, okay? While she has no knowledge as to why a particular individual is choosing not to take one of these vaccines. All right. So she goes on to say, uh, from a practical standpoint, and I'm, making, I'm quoting again, hospitals and physicians aren't going to explicitly implement the kind of policy I'm advocating for for fear of lawsuits. So now, all right, another reason she doesn't think this should be done could be done, even though she thinks it should be done, is a financial reason. All right. When a group of continuing on the quote, when a group of Texas healthcare providers began exploring a scaled back version of the idea, proposing that quote, vaccine status therefore may be considered when making triage decisions as part of the physician's assessment of each individual's likelihood of survival, close quote, continuing the quote of the article. The project was quickly abandoned as a homework assignment, close quote. All right. She admits no one is going to yank a ventilator from an unvaccinated patient. All right. And that's not what she's endorsing. That's what she says. Continuing on in the real world, these decisions are going to be made in split second assessments upon arrival. My argument is that doctors aren't acting unethically by putting a finger on the scale in favor of the vaccinated. They're behaving rationally and justly. But here's the thing, close quote. 
as soon as somebody, she said before they're not acting as judges, but she uses the imagery of the scales of justice, right? They're putting their finger on the scale. Therefore, you have two individuals who are in need, right? But because one is privileged, right? Is determined privileged because they have taken the vaccination and another is determined lacking privilege because they have not taken the vaccination, right? Again, we're coming out of another situation where we've been inundated over the years to talk about privilege. But yet uh, Miss Ruth here is making the argument that privilege is a necessity in terms of a person's health needs. And again, she opened up with the one of the severest of all health situations, a cancer patient. Hmm. She admits that this is an uncomfortable conversation and she closes with the irresponsibly unvaccinated have made it a necessary one, close quote. So she has made the situation, hey, if based in her world, right? Her vision of the world, if if she had all of her druthers, right? Those who were unvaccinated, if they came to a hospital in need, they would be given less of a priority regardless of their situation, cancer patient, accident, right? They would be given a lesser uh, priority than those who are vaccinated. This would be in her world, but we have individuals in America who are proposing said things. Now, this may, let's, let's bring this closer to home. Now, you may have family members, people that you work with who, for whatever reason, have chosen not to be vaccinated, right? Now, imagine that individual getting into some situation, an accident, okay? Um, they discover that they have cancer, right? Or some other ailment completely wholly unrelated to COVID. And for whatever reason, they have not taken the vaccine. Imagine your, your loved one then having to have to go to the hospital, right? And then they are given a lower priority because they have not taken a particular vaccine, which reports are coming out that are, are showing that the vaccine, um, while individuals are taking it, it lessens the impact regarding symptoms, but it doesn't prevent the spreading of COVID, okay? And, you know, we've got this Delta variant, and now uh, in the past week, they've talked about the Mu variant, Mu uh, variant uh, that they're paying attention to, right? And now they're also talking about booster shots because of the, 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 the efficacy in terms of time regarding uh, the original vaccines that have come out. They may be waning. But again, imagine a loved one, someone that you work with, a neighbor who, for whatever reason, has chosen not to take the vaccine, but because they ended up in a hospital, right, and are in a triage situation, right, they are moved to a, a second, third tier situation because they have not taken the vaccine. And so privilege, these things that individuals have been arguing against, privilege falls on the vaccinated. And in inequality falls on, and it, it is borne by, according to uh, Miss Ruth, I forgot her name, Marcus, the inequality is borne by those who have chosen not to take the vaccine for whatever reason. These are arguments that are being made, that are being pu published in national newspapers like the Atlantic, the Washington Post that in some cases are taking effect in New York City, New Orleans, San Francisco. Uh, private employers are putting people in a situation where they may have to, they have to choose between um, taking the vaccine and their employment. These are the, the situations that I am. If I get a little bit more personal, my, my youngest, she uh, works at the University of Arkansas in the for the recruiting, 
right? And she was told that she would need to take the vaccine if she would want to meet face to face with um, new recruits that are coming for the football team. If she didn't, it would have to be done Zoom wise. But then the University of Arkansas came out and said that individuals attending their sporting events, yes, I know y'all had your football game yesterday, that individuals did not have to show any type of proof of vaccination or anything like that. How is that? You've got a student who goes to the university who's being required to take it if she wants to fully do her job, but individuals can come in and fill up the stadium to watch the Razorbacks play. I'm talking about discrimination. This is what we are talking about. Discrimination in terms of access to particular things such as restaurants, gyms, movie theaters, right? Possible discrimination ending up on no fly list in terms of airline travel. And then what Ruth Marcus is arguing for in the Washington Post in this opinion piece, discrimination in terms of something significant in regarding health care. I would hope that wherever that you fall, whether you have taken the vaccine or not, that you would find it unethical, and if I dig even deeper, morally objectionable to discriminate against somebody because they have chosen a particular way. If what we have been arguing about, books have come out, cities have burned, people have accused elected officials of being racist this way or showing privilege or inequities and uh, so on and so forth. Because we have to remember this. And so now I'm coming to the men and women who look like me, right? A A large percentage of men and women who look like me in terms of skin color a large percentage still are unvaccinated. So I need you to remember this. She's talking in application about you. The the argued no fly list in another opinion piece in the Atlantic, she's talking about you. I'm bringing this even closer to home, to individuals who look like me in terms of skin color. Could you imagine going into a hospital, black man or black woman, and you are put second or third in the priority because you have not taken the vaccine or your child has not taken the vaccine? So there is real discrimination. That is real discrimination, not on the basis of your skin color, though, but on the basis of the fact that you have not chosen to participate in taking a particular uh, medical procedure, namely a vaccination. So that's something for you to think about. Um, Again, this is Philip Fletcher with the Humanity Matters Show. I'm glad you are joining me tonight, whether live or watching the recording or on the podcast. Got some comments we're gonna jump into before we move to the next session move back and take a little self-care right before we really dig deep and talk about uh, the Texas abortion law, uh, the main thing I want to talk about tonight. So, hey, if you're watching this, please share this, tag somebody in this, um, spread the word of what we're talking about. Um, Again, if you've got something that you want to say, I'm going to put it up here, entertain it, talk about it. Again, I love to learn positive and negative. I want as many people people to the table as possible. So not only is it a diverse conversation, but it is truly inclusive. Everybody is heard. So let's look at some comments here. Uh, Paul said, you are entitled to be left alone as long as you are not violating the rights of others. That is correct. Paul, thank you for the comment, right? You are entitled to be left alone. I think people want to be left alone. They don't want to be aggressed. They don't want to be bothered. They want to move through their life, right, with as few obstacles put in their way as possible so that they can discover 
why they're here, what their purpose is, and to realize meaning in life. But when we put obstacles in front of people, when we aggress people, when we seek to do things that inhibit people from focusing on their purpose to discover meaning and their focus has to shift to the obstacles, right? That have been put in front of their life. Like we're talking about discrimination. That's just, that's not what we should be doing. So that's why we're talking about it today. So Paul appreciate it. Uh, Glenda says this, Glenda is kind of long. um, So I'm going to read it. Some years ago, I was tested uh, herpes positive. And ever since then, I have been taking different kinds of medicine, but yet no improvement until I saw testimonies. All right. On the internet of how, um, sorry if I'm mispronouncing this. All right. Has been curing different people from different kinds of diseases. Immediately, I contacted him after our discussion. He prepared the medicine and sent it to me. All right. Which I received. It took according to his instructions. Now my doctor just confirmed I'm negative. My heart is filled with joy. All right. Hey, Glenda, I'm happy for you. That's awesome to hear. Uh, Let me keep reading your comment here. My heart is filled with joy. All right. So, hey, thank you for that, Glenda. I'm glad you uh, have been healed. Right. Um, Awesome. Uh, Again, uh, Paul Count. Paul comments are unvaccinated people are dying more right now because they are being treated as second class citizens. Um, I don't know. I don't know that information. Uh, Paul, there will be something uh, to find out. Again, uh, the Washington Post opinion piece uh, that I read from September 3rd that was published um, from that's how she, I have to say, envisions the world if she had her druthers. Right. Um, so I, I am hoping that individuals who are going to the hospital, they are not having to um, disclose whether they have been vaccinated or not. Maybe that's a question that's being asked. I don't know. Um, and I hope that regardless of their answer, um, they are not being treated any differently. OK. Uh, Donna says this. Uh, I would hate to think the medical profession would place the unvaccinated second to vaccinated. Just do your job and let us be. Donna, I I would hope the same thing. And thank you for your comment. I know a lot of great doctors, a lot of great nurses, uh, uh, nurse practitioners. My own sister, she's studying to be a nurse uh, practitioner. Um, She loves working with her patients uh, as a nurse that I've heard her talk about over the years. Um, and, uh, I, I, you know, for me, I believe better things of people. I know there's individuals out there who, uh, have a particular way of seeing life and that they, uh, for a number of reasons, um, they believe their ideas, uh, some ideas that are seeking to control others, right? Those ideas need to be put forward and they like to see those enacted, uh, but in doing things like that, somebody suffers. There's all there's always a negative trade-off to every action that we take. And uh, what uh, was rep- proposed in this Washington Post uh, article, all right, is, is something that I believe is um, on, on a final uh, judgment is, is something that is unethical. And, and, and immoral. And I know Miss Marcus would make a different case, uh, but nonetheless, uh, that's my summary of it. So, hey, thank you. As we move on uh, to our next segment, hey, have you connected with me on social media? If you not follow me on YouTube, please go over there and subscribe. I greatly appreciate it. I'm trying to hit 200 subscribers. That would be awesome. Uh, you follow me on Twitter at Phil Fletcher. Twitter is kind of interesting world. I rare I go on there sometimes, really just to to read things. Sometimes I'll tweet, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I have this one thought I'll just put out, and then hey, I'll let it go. Uh, most of my stuff I talk about typically on Facebook. 
videos here, so on and so forth. So let's talk about self-care. Let's take a breather for a second, right? Uh, spend some time the last uh, few days um, just really taking care of myself, my mind, and my body. Uh, didn't do any type of work. I've been getting a lot of work emails and messages, but haven't answered them, right? Uh, so if you work with me in my nonprofit capacity, just know I'm going to get to those. But that's going to come like tomorrow night when I start working again. Uh, but it's been good to really focus. Uh, I'm reading a couple of books right now. Um, one, finishing up Jordan Peterson's uh, 12 Rules for Life. Uh, I'm almost done with that. Um, reading Brave New World by uh, Huxley. I've been working through that. Uh, some Carl Jung, uh, reading some stuff on just therapy and mental health. Uh, so that's been real good. Been checking in on my dad. Um, he had to go to the hospital last week. So please keep him in your prayers, positive thoughts. Uh, he's doing better. He has to go back next week for some checkups. So um, I'm just praying for good news on that end. And it was just important for me to just like get away. So me and the uh, wife went down to Atlanta, just got back today, just chilled out with uh, my in-laws, my brother and sister-in-law. And uh, that was a good time and just feel like I'm back at it, ready to roll. And so it's good. It's very good to set boundaries and make sure that you are doing what you need for you. The world's going to keep moving, right? Me, from a Christian perspective, God's got it, right? And it's important to take rest, resting your your soul, resting your mind, resting your heart, resting your body. Um, uh, Thursday night, took myself to the movie to see the new Marvel movie, Shang-Chi. That was very important. Uh, just to be able to be, eat some popcorn. They didn't have any butter, though. How does a movie theater not have butter, especially when you got like some big movies coming out? So, but nonetheless, Shang-Chi, that was a great movie. I did a review about that. So if you haven't seen that, check that movie out. I want to actually go see it again, right? Um, so I'm excited about those movies. Spider-Man coming out, Turtles coming out. Great. Got me some new collectibles. So if you see right behind me, I uh, got Dr. Fate, the new collectible. I've been collecting the McFarlane series. Uh, if you're not familiar with me, I like superheroes. So right now, my backdrop is Alex Ross painting of the Justice League. Got a few of the collectibles back here. I do Star Wars Lego building. Uh, taking a pause right from that right now. I did see like this awesome r2d2 uh, at target and it's pretty tall it's pretty big and i want to get that uh so saving up some dollars to get that that'll probably be our next lego project but all that to say legos reading comic books doing collectibles you know doing just some reading that that really builds me up is great self-care for me right obviously i love going to the gym and working out um, that's awesome. And just simply being, right? And turning off the noise of the world. Like, check out a Facebook from time to time. Check out of whatever social media. Check out of, like, check out of those things and, you know, enjoy the moments. Like, when I was in Atlanta, uh, one of the, I had the, just the awesome opportunity to go to the Martin Luther King uh, National Historic Center. And I just, I didn't take any pictures or anything like that. I just wanted to be in the moment. And that was like holy ground to me just because he's a very influential person in my own life. Um, I use uh, religiously his six steps to nonviolence um, about educating oneself, uh, info gathering, educating oneself, personal commitment, uh, entering into that dialogue um direct action and then reconciliation like i use those and those are important because at the end of the day i want enemies to become friends i want those who oppose me or don't agree with me to become friends i want people to understand that yeah we may have disagreements but at the end of the day i see you as a human being and 
I'm never going to throw you under the bus because of a position you particularly hold. I may look at you and be like, man, I don't know about that. Or lady, I don't know about that. But I promise you this. If you end up homeless, I'll help you. If you're hungry, I'm going to help you. Uh, because at the fundamental level, we are men and women made in the image and likeness of God. So all that to say, being at the Martin Luther King um, historic site, being able to see Ebenezer Church, being able to see the house in which he was born in, um, and and seeing where him and his wife, Coretta Scott King, are, are buried, and just watching this water uh, roll down in this pool, uh, you know, quoting uh, from the scripture, let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. That was just like just a holy moment uh, for me. And it did a lot to nourish my mind and soul and and have me to remember um, my own purpose and pursuit of meaning in my own life. And then secondly, how to treat other people, especially those uh, who are different and see the world different and seeking to understand why it is, all right? So self-care is important. So if you ain't taking care of yourself, do it. Take a moment, watch a football game, you know, take a walk, do a hobby, read a book, write a song, play a song, dance, you know, dance in the street, dance like nobody is watching, right? Live a little unabandoned and it's going to be okay. It'll be nourishment for your soul. So self-care is very important. Now, let's dig into some uh, some heavy stuff. All right. So I've really had to like, whew, really get my mind, you know, right in regards to abortion. Uh, let me say, um, I've never like had like a really written publicly uh, or talked a lot about abortion. I have my views on it, which we're going to talk about. So I'm going to be like clear as water tonight on abortion in general you know, allude to the Texas law, so on and so forth. Um, but if you pay attention, I'll say this. My my whole thing, my purpose, and you hear me talk about it, I beat it like a drum on the show, my podcast. I beat it like a drum. It's what f- one of the major themes that runs through my nonprofit and my nonprofit work and everything I do is that humanity matters. Like humanity matters. That's like been that's been my drum beat uh, at least for the last ten years. Um, that has been like my drum beat. If you go on my YouTube channel, I have a whole video series called uh, Humanity Matters, and look it up. And I talk about the Imago Day. I talk about race. Uh, I talk about a host of different issues, vocation or the meaning of work, so on and so forth. Right. And so all that to say, the reason I bring that up is this discussion about abortion. All right. So if you're not familiar, uh, the Texas legislature passed their abortion uh, bill. Um, Abortion after six weeks could not be done. All right. And I understand how that has an impact on women, but I also believe it has an impact on men. And it also has an impact on individuals who experience directly the abortion. So it's important for me to just on the outside, out, outset, lay out what I believe. Now, what I'm about to put up, I stand by it. And when I say I stand by it, meaning I'm willing to give my life for what I'm about to put up. I need you to 
understand that. I need to be so crystal clear that what I am about to put up in its four I believe statements, right? Um, and then I'm going to talk about how these play out regarding abortion. I also understand nobody's going to probably be satisfied, but you know what? It doesn't matter because these are the principles that I, I, I hold to and that not only influence my view of abortion, but also influence my view and work regarding the death penalty, regarding homelessness, uh, regarding all any aspect regarding poverty, regarding race, regarding war, so on and so forth. I, I, no, I got it. I'm, nobody's perfect, right? But these are the principles that, if you will, sit on top of my faith in Jesus Christ. Am I perfect in that? Nope. That's why I need Jesus. But nonetheless, I know there's people that are not religiously inclined, but I believe it serves to be an aid to even those who don't believe in God. Now, this first one is unavoidable. So. Here we go. So first, when I say humanity matters, this is what I mean, that I believe fundamentally at conception, a human being is the image bearer of God possessing full dignity and worth to exist and flourish. I fundamentally believe that at conception, a human being is the image bearer of God. And he or she possesses fully dignity and worth by virtue of their existence. And that by virtue of their existence, flourish. Now, whatever flourishing means is going to look different for each individual. But nonetheless, this is the starting point. So anytime you see that Humanity Matters logo, anytime you see a hashtag in which I put Humanity Matters, anytime you hear me reference that, this is what I am saying, that I fundamentally believe that at conception, not at heartbeat, not at the first full first trimester, not at the second or third trimester, not when he or she passes through the uh, from the out of the vagina into the world, right? No, at conception, I fundamentally believe that is a human being who is an image bearer of God, possessing full dignity and worth, existing and flourishing. Second thing I believe, that when I say humanity matters, I believe individual human beings possess the freedom to determine for him or herself a course of life. And this should not, this should occur not at the expense of another human being. So you, me, everyone that has existed, everyone that has been conceived, that they possess the freedom, all right, to determine for him or herself a course of life. But it should not be done at the expense of others. This is what I fundamentally believe when I say humanity matters. Let me go on. I believe. When I say humanity matters, I believe individual human beings should not experience aggression upon his or her life for the sake of utility, making another individual's life flourishing more easily. So I believe 
that an individual human being should not experience any form of aggression, creation of obstacles as a means of utility. I'm talking about utilitarianism, that I'm going to do this to this individual or to this group so that I can flourish. For example, I'm talking about slavery in America. Slave masters aggressed upon Africans who were brought over during the transatlantic slave trade. They aggressed upon those men and women and used them for whatever reason, economic, social, in order that their life, slave masters and those that benefited from it, to make their life of flourishing more easily. Human beings should not experience that. And then finally, when I say humanity matters, what I'm saying is that I believe, oh, wrong one, there we go. When I say humanity matters, I also acknowledge this and I believe there is evil in this world. And as such, individuals should freely gather to confront evil. Now, the key word in there, or it's two. One is the acknowledgement that there is evil in the world. And that evil is manifested by the behavior of individuals. We're light and dark, order and chaos. We are shadow as well. But when evil is seen, Individuals should freely gather together to confront that evil. The other key word is freely. I don't think individuals should be forced to, but that individuals recognize, hey, that's just not right. And that those individuals come together to address that particular evil. And then when it's confronted, dealt with, then they go back to whatever situation that they are dealing with so now that i have laid those out and you know where i am coming from what does that mean philip in regards to this thing that happened in texas specifically and then in more general here in america i'm asking myself what are ways that we can move forward there may be some things that you thought about before that you read about before these are things that I've thought about, um, and I'm just going to put those out there. Um, so now in the case of abortion, one, abortion is an evil perpetrated upon another human being. Philip, you said that. Yes, I did. I did. In order to be consistent, with what I'm talking about, it is a evil that is perpetrated upon another human being. Now, I acknowledge, like for instance in scripture, right? And even in the course of human events, there are acts of evil that have been uh, per perpetrated, all right? to accomplish something for an individual, for a group, or even a national interest. All right. In some cases, while the outcome may appear virtuous, all right, nonetheless, that act itself was still evil. I think about what happened with, from a Christian perspective, what happened with Jesus Christ. He was crucified unjustly that was an evil act nonetheless it was done i think about uh rahab who lied regarding the spies that came to spy out the land those were that was a evil act nonetheless it was done okay In order for me to be consistent that human beings 
from conception are image bearers of God, full of dignity and worth to exist and to flourish. To take that individual's life is an evil act. But I have to say this as well, and I have not, but, and I have to say this as well. I empathize with any woman who has had to or is even now contemplating making such a difficult, emotional, psychological, physical decision to terminate the life of another human being. In that context, though, I have to strongly acknowledge in clear terms, abortion is an evil act perpetrated on another human being. All right. Now, if you miss any part of this, please go back a couple of minutes and you can see, please revisit again. When I say humanity matters, what I firmly believe regarding humanity matters. Again, as a review, when I say humanity matters, I believe fundamentally at conception, a human being is the image bearer of God possessing full dignity and worth to exist and flourish. When I say humanity matters, I believe individual human beings possess the freedom to determine for him or herself a course of life. And this should occur not at the expense of another human being. When I say humanity matters, I'm saying I believe individual human beings should not experience aggression upon his or her life for the sake of utility making another individual's life flourish more easily. And then finally, when I say humanity matters, I'm saying I believe there is evil in this world and as such, individuals should freely gather to confront evil. Now on social media, since this has come out, what happened in Texas regarding this law, people have posted things like RBG, meaning Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she passed away um, and how she has passed on the baton to confront uh, this thing about abortion. Obviously, the Supreme Court chose not to take this up. Um, there have been discussions about, you know, men should receive vasectomies. And uh, it's a woman's, uh, This is, I'm summarizing a quote by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that this decision remains solely with the woman, right? Been told that, since I am a man that I have no say in this discussion. Um, and in fact, I also read where uh, men should not even be voting on this particular issue. Now on those last points, if I follow that out, then there are a host of things that people should not be commenting on because they are not involved in it. Like there are a whole bunch of people running around being doctors, right? Regarding the vaccination, telling people they need to get vaccine, right? People are running around talking about the situation of black people. They ain't black. Running around talking about the situation and so on and so forth. But the fact of the matter is that in order for a human being to come into this world, it demands the participation of both a man and a woman. It demands the participation regarding a man and a woman. So in the case, let me go on and bring this up and shoot an elephant in the room. In the case of rape and incest, that is terrible. That is an immoral, evil act. And if in that act, an individual is conceived, that is a tenuous situation. And I'll and I'll and I'll get into the the solutions to that. But in those and then in the cases, if we rise up regarding medical situations and the life of the mother, the life of the child, again, you have both a doctor and his patient there. In order for them to make a most personal and again very difficult psychological, emotional, and physical decision. But then, if we rise up and then it is just for a case of utility. Or it's because, oh, you're not going to be able to financially afford a child. So this is where I'm going to primarily rest. Even though 
taking the life of a human being who has been conceived, taking that life is still is not a good act. So I've seen Bantied About and Red propose solutions. Somebody had, had posted a, a Norwegian uh, solution model that there's no prohibition regarding abortion, that there's an emphasis on personal responsibility and sex education. And in fact, in those countries, the sexual activity rate is low for teenagers, right? But then I have to ask myself, when we look at that solution for America, we have to ask ourselves, our culture, how does our culture view sexuality, right? And promiscuity versus a Norwegian culture. I've seen uh, proposed vasectomies for young men. All right. Somebody had referenced that a woman can sleep with a hundred, uh, you know, different men, right? But in that time, in a nine-month period, right, she can only carry one child, right? But men could run around and impregnate numerous women. So why not regulate men's bodies as well? But I think for both men and women, right, in terms of regulating not only people's bodies, which I don't think there should be a regulation for people's bodies. So let me go on and say that. I don't think the government should be regulating women's bodies, and I don't think the government should be regulating men's bodies. So let me go ahead and say that, right? But let's entertain the argument or the, the, the proposed solution of vasectomies, right? What about our population and population growth, labor production, right? If we continue to have an older population and we're not producing human beings in order to pr- replace that older population, meaning human beings that are going to work, right, or create and, and or create jobs, and participate in the economy, right? If we're having less and less people being produced, right? Then what does that mean for a lot of the programs that are taxpayer funded? But those tax dollars come from private individuals who are producing an income. And then uh, Jen Saki had referenced Again, and it seems to always be brought up, poor and black communities. Okay. This is what I'm sincerely tired of. Because um, honestly, Planned Parenthood sets itself up in low-income communities. Abortion clinics are not absent around poor communities and communities populated majority by black men and women. There was a, 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 I was been looking for some studies and a study I found in looking at uh, live births versus abortions, right? And so live births and this number, now this is from 2017, all right? Uh, Live births for black Americans, 575,000. All right, or 14.9 percent of all live births. Right, whites were two million fifty one thousand, fifty three point two percent. All right, Hispanics nine hundred twenty eight thousand. There were twenty four point one percent. So, but blacks fourteen point nine percent. Right, but the number of abortions occurred among Black Americans thirty four point seven. Listen to that. They were third in time in terms of live births, but in terms of abortions, they were first. I digress. I digress. If I may go on. Argument, men should not have been voting on these issues in Texas. Well, I looked up the Texas legislature, all right? 
So there are a total of 33 women in the House and nine in the Senate in the state of Texas, right? So in the House, six of those women in the House and six of the women in the Senate are Republicans. So they're voting. Women are voting. 27 in the House are Democrats and three in the House, in the Senate are Democrat Democrats. So women are voting. So then the question becomes, what if it was all women voting? How would this play out? This is not this is not just about genders voting. This is about deeply held fundamental beliefs. I would argue rest in whether or not we believe that in the womb that is a human being or not. So I, I see those that question pro-life individuals and say, you fight for those in the womb, but when it comes to when they come out of the womb, like immigration, universal health care, food stamps, so on and so forth, you don't fight that way, right? So let's acknowledge that inconsistency. But then it has to be reflected back to those who are considered uh, pro-choice, right? When is that? When is... You see, see, I can only use the terms that I use, right? So when is that human being in the womb, when is he or she designated a human being? That's the question I have, because reflecting back, so am I to infer that that person that you um, say Black Lives Matter and that person that you say about we need to look out for immigrants, so on and so forth, and refugees, right, and those individuals who are homeless, at what point did they become a human being? Because the argument is being made that at some point previous that you saw that it was okay for that person to be aborted. So while there is inconsistencies in terms of individuals that are pro-life, there are also inconsistencies regarding those who are pro-choice. And so for me, the fundamental question becomes, is the growing being in the womb a human being or not and if you say no then my second question is at what point does that being in the womb become a human being that's the question i have I will say this as well. There are valid critiques of religious institutions. Now, I don't, I'm not familiar with how uh, Islam, Buddhism, um, or any of the other, th those religions, at least in America, how they address abortion. So I know within Christianity in America, obviously there's a split. Typically, if you're more progressive, you you lean you tend towards woman's choice a woman's choice right if you tend more towards evangelical more conservative right you're more pro life okay but my question becomes this regardless of where you fall progressive evangelical conservative catholic is how are you or your Christian religious institution, how are you responding to aid those women or couples who have chosen not to keep their child? So they have said, we're not going to abort our child, but we cannot keep our child. So then the question becomes, and I'm using this big C, where is the church? regardless if you're Catholic or Protestant, regardless if you're high church, low church, Baptist, Presbyterian, 
charismatic, so on and so forth. How are you addressing that need? But this is the same question I have about the Big C Church regarding homelessness, regarding um, poverty. This is poverty in general. This is my big question with the church because I think, and I still make this argument, the Big C Church and I'm spends a whole lot of money on buildings, programs, and things like that, and not the, if you will, the red letter things that Jesus talked about. So that critique of the church, I hear those on the other side and I agree with them. So it's not enough to be like, ooh, pro-life, a child should not be aborted, but gosh darn it, what program do you have in place? Do you have some orphanage created? Do you have some ministry in place to bring all of those children in are you working with dare i say a planned parenthood or some type of person that does abortions and says hey let's sit down and work together now the studies have shown that abortions have been on a a a decline and information i get from is from a study uh that was done by johnson titled Abortions in the United States by Race. All right. So for religious institutions, specifically the church, again, where are you at? So in conclusion, I believe we must be consistent in our affirmation that humanity matters from the womb to the tomb, all right? Two, we must be consistent that abortion terminates the life of a human being. A human being who could have been an American, a refugee, a homeless individual, one with white skin, but the, the data doesn't lie, but in most cases with black skin. Just as I detest the power of the state to enact the death penalty. Now, hear me out here. Just as I detest the power of the state to enact the death penalty. And I thank Dr. Peg Falls Corbett for her work in that. I encourage you to look up that Humanity Matters one-on-one -on -one, uh, where I have an interview with Dr. Peg Falls Corbett as we talk about the death penalty. All right. But I equally detest in any form any form i equally detest any form of state funding which supports the death of a human being who has committed no crimes specifically those who are in the womb i believe we must firmly reject any and all taxpayer funding of any medical institution or nonprofit which advances such practices but philip what are you saying well pause so, solution. So, those who support this practice, abortion, should have the freedom to voluntarily support this practice. Right? So, no taxpayer dollars at the state level, federal level, go to any of these hospitals, nonprofits whatsoever. But if you firmly believe in this, on this side, then you should have the freedom to reach into your own pocket, set up a direct deposit uh, or an electronic, uh, electronic funds transfer and send it directly to said hospital or nonprofit. And then whatever money they have is what they have. If you firmly believe that. Now I'm consistent in that, even in regards to things like education, for those that want universal health care, so on and so forth. If you firmly believe that, then you don't need a law to take your money, right? If you firmly believe that, then you should get up, <laughs> connect with that individual institution, nonprofit, and freely give your own money while, here's the second half of this, just as those like myself 
who don't want their taxpayer money going to any of these hospitals, nonprofits who do this procedure, right? I should be free not to support this with my dollars. Why do I say all this? Because when I say humanity matters, I say I believe fundamentally at conception a human being is the image bearer of God, possessing full dignity and worth to exist and flourish. Do I want, and I've heard these things, you know, young ladies going somewhere and, you know, either doing it themselves or doing some unhealthy thing? No, I do not. I don't. I don't. Do I believe that that's a decision that's actually between that woman and that man? I do. I do. I don't think it that decision should be solely upon her because it, in order for that life to be conceived, it demanded a sperm and an egg. So it's no immaculate conceptions happening. I think it is fundamentally wrong that tax dollars should go to any institution. Now, people will say, well, they're not going to directly fund abortion. Yes, I got that. But that money is going to still go to uphold that institution somehow in some other form or fashion. And those tax dollars shouldn't go there. So if that institution has within its services conducting that procedure, then that should be voluntarily supported by those individuals who firmly hold to supporting that practice. And they have that freedom, just like those who do not support that practice. They have the freedom to voluntarily not support those institutions. Do I think it's important to educate people regarding sex? Yes, I do. Do I think it should be good at home? Yes, I do. In whatever educational capacity. But I think there's second and third order effects of that. Again, that gets back to how we're educating individuals in the public school system, private, so on and so forth. Is it tough? Yes. Again, I completely empathize with those who have had and who are contemplating this procedure, an abortion. The emotional, physical, psychological weight uh, that is experienced or that would be carried, completely empathize. And it shouldn't be born alone. Do I think the government should regulate bodies? No. Just like I don't want the government to regulate vaccines in people, just like I don't want the government to regulate masks, I don't want the government to regulate a woman's body, and I don't want the government to regulate a man's body as it relates to reproduction. So for those who... Who, who make the argument, you know, like Republicans, you know, don't want, you know, or conservatives or people on the right don't want uh, you to regulate their bodies regarding COVID, but they want to regulate a woman's body regarding uh, this particular situation. They're wrong. And just like Democrats want typically or progressives want to mandate like vaccines or masks right on somebody's body but not regulate a woman but some are making an argument to regulate a man they're wrong too we should not tolerate the government regulating anything regarding our bodies you have better knowledge about your body than anybody else so those are my thoughts. So we talked about discrimination, talked about self-care, and we've delved into abortion. So I appreciate you joining me on tonight again. 
Connect with me on social media, whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, over on YouTube, or the World Wide Web, philipfletcher.org. Also, connect with me on anchor.fm or wherever you get your podcast. Just look up the Humanity Matters podcast and subscribe. Give me a review. I would greatly appreciate it. Right? Um, again, follow me on Patreon. I'll release some um, uh, very unique content over there. That's on a subscription basis. Uh, connect with me over there. I would love to see you over there. So, as always, remember to be love, to be kind, to be generous. And if you remember to live in hope, we can do the impossible. Y'all take care. God bless. Be courageous. Hey, if you found something of value, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Find us on Facebook at Dr. Philip Fletcher. Find us on Twitter at Philip Fletcher. And as always, visit us on the website, philipfletcher.org.